and I actually knew Alice McDougall. I remember him calling me once and saying something like, uh, he was mad about something, I don't have to go into details, but he said, I know you understand, you're another Scotsman. So anyway, um, it's nice for MacDonald to come and talk uh, in honor of Ellis. He was, he was a great uh, leader in the field of corrections, and um, in addition to being a leader in, uh, as a scholar here, he was also a leader in the field in terms of actually administering correctional institutions. So today what I want to do is I want to talk to you a bit about uh, work I've been doing uh, with uh, colleagues in epidemiology and urban planning, including a former faculty member here at South Carolina, Robert Stokes. Um, and it's part of the book project we put together. Um, so I want to talk, just tell you a few stories, and then I want to walk you through some examples. And the highlight that I'm going to focus on here, because it's criminology, is crime. But many of these examples I could also expand, and we do have evidence to expand in looking at health outcomes as well. So consider these true but all too common stories. A woman walking up the south side of Chicago is accosted by a man who puts a gun in her neck and takes her to a nearby abandoned building. When he is unable to get her in a boarded up building, he forces her into an empty room and rapes her. A boy in the East St. Louis is laughing one minute and breathless from asthma attack the next. An ambulance rushes him to a hospital, but his asthma attacks return in a city where garbage collection can be sporadic, raw sewage backs up into people's home. A young woman in the suburban New, New Jersey is killed when a car is driven across a roadway, divider hits oncoming traffic. The car is driven by another young man and so badly damaged that firefighters need to forcibly extricate both drivers and the passenger. These are all tragedies. Could they have been avoided by changing the context in which these events occurred? Now consider these true alternative stories. A woman in southwest Philadelphia decides to do something about the vacant lots in her neighborhood. Eyesores created when abandoned homes were torn down and nothing replaced them. She transforms these otherwise abandoned spaces by picking up the trash and debris and planting grass. The abandoned spaces become a pocket park that is used for picnics, community meetings, arts and crafts for local kids. When the transformation of these formerly vacant lots happens, crime drops in our neighborhood, and our neighbors feel less stressed. A boy in a high point neighborhood of Seattle comes home, uh, that comes, moves into a new home that was specially designed to prevent asthma and other breathing problems. He is happier, healthier, and can breathe, much better than his new home while his parents can finally get a restful night's sleep. A young woman in Charlotte's uptown neighborhood no longer needs to drive uh, her car to work because she lives near a new right, light rail line and doesn't have to depend so much on, tra on, a, on a car to get to work. Uh, she is part of a new generation, less, ex less exposed to the dangers of the road because of this new transit system. An immigrant family in Los Angeles that lives near and works in a newly revitalized, well-managed, and now thriving commercial district find that they suddenly have a greater choice of goods, services, many of which are locally sourced. And their home neighborhood has become a safer and more vibrant due to deeply invested community stakeholders and place managers. These stories are real stories. Real lives get changed in positive ways when we make thoughtful, thoughtful designs to places. Real lives can get marred when we let places deteriorate and fester. Popular culture links good health and safety to individual decisions and strategies parents develop with their children, especially those living in the most dangerous and blighted neighborhoods. If someone is in a socially disadvantaged neighborhood, manages to, manage to live safe and healthy life, popular discourse credits their personal drive in making the best out of these hard scrabble surroundings. That's only part of the equation maybe even just a small part. So what I want to talk about here is the decisions of, about how we can pave, how we can design safer communities. And the basic argument I have is that decisions and our success are deeply shaped by the context in which we live, work, and play. Uh, Place-based programs uh, that we can design can actually advance human health and safety. And in some ways, what I'm talking about today is really just a return to basic 19th century ideas of urban planning. Uh, 19th century ideas that are well rooted in criminology. For those of you as criminology students have studied maybe social disorganization or basic ideas about the important role of place. And so this is really just bringing those ideas back, 
but thinking about them more strategically. So trying to marry some of these ideas to actual science of place-based uh, decision making. And so I'm going to go through some examples of that. And the idea is that we can marry science and policy together to have better evidence on what works. So if you think about just some evidence, this descriptive evidence, uh, of that place matters. Electric power, water treatment, building codes, roadway designs, uh, it could be argued have done more to advance human health and safety in the last 150 years than pills, potions, or any kind of medical treatment. Uh, we're often, you know, we're safer because of the built environment in which we live. But much of what we do isn't based on science. Since the 1970s, though, there's been this growing emphasis of thinking about, more importantly, the role of place in shaping our health and safety. We see this in some of the movement we've seen in urban planning, around new urbanism, or active living communities. And these are basic ideas I, I could tell even during my walk around here in Columbia uh, that are taking root, which is the idea of thinking about making more mixed use development. So providing places for people to walk, uh, narrow street grid patterns, trying to reduce our dependency on automobiles. Some of these ideas are also take their roots in criminology. Uh, C. Ray Jeffrey at Florida State came up with this idea in the late 1960s, early 70s about crime prevention through environmental design. So this idea that you can design places specifically to prevent crime. Most of these ideas though, haven't been married with science. Most of these ideas are kind of theories uh, with maybe individual case studies. And so what I want to talk to you about is the idea of making science a more central feature in trying to test these ideas in real world contexts. So here are some examples of new urbanism or green living. Um, so this idea is, again, our old ideas. Savannah, Georgia, which many of you probably spend some time in, at least around St. Patty's Day, right? Everybody's Irish on St. Patrick's Day. All right, so Savannah, Georgia, right, was one of America's first planned cities. Uh, and specifically, they wanted to mix uh, urban green space in with urban uh, green space in with urban neighborhoods. So every kind of neighborhood has a park in the middle of it. Uh, and so that's an early design. It wasn't based on science. Some of these same ideas around emerged in the 1930s. Uh, the Garden City movement, Greenbelt, Maryland is an example of this. Um, but none of these ideas, so we see pockets of these ideas around the country and at different eras. And then since the 1970s, there's been this push to thinking more about active living by design. So you know, how can we design communities to make it more easy for people to walk, uh, to work, to, work, uh, to uh, destinations like where you're going to eat, um, the idea of just trying to reduce our kind of sedentary nature. Crime prevention through environmental design, again, like I said, this idea about how do you shape the built environment in a way that makes areas more or less attractive to crime, hopefully less attractive, right? So here's an example from Canada, um, uh, where they basically point out that, like, hey, you should probably trim your trees, right? It's kind of hard to see. So the idea being, right, if, you, if, if the trees are trimmed, maybe it's, hard, it's, e it's not as easy for a burglar to break into a house undetected. There's a theoretical mechanism behind all this, so I just kind of gave you broad uh, brush ideas. But the basic idea is that if you think about it, if you can in some ways take an economic model, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in economics, um, but this is just a basic supply and demand idea. Uh, but the, the built environment shapes our opportunities. So if you make it easier, for example, for people to walk, to use transit, to drive their bicycle, it makes kind of the easy decision the more likely the default decision. It makes the automatic decision something healthier. More, more people out in the street, uh, more people watching each other, you know, that could make an area more safe. Um, and, you know, so if you think about it, just as a lot in terms of a crime or health outcome, you could think about this so in a crime context, you could think about, you know, if you make uh, the payoff from crime, the difficulty of getting caught, make it slightly more difficult, you like it slightly, you know, greater chance that you're going to be caught, then basically what's going to happen is the demand for crime, even if it's not, if there's basic demand, that demand curve is going to shift down. 
So at any given point, people are going to have to work much harder to kind of commit the same crime. But if you don't really believe in kind of a behavioral model of people making decisions, you could also think about how when we shape places differently, maybe we also change norms. So people start to adopt a kind of a different perspective about a place. Eli Anderson, who's a Yale sociologist, has a recent book uh, about the cosmopolitan canopy where he talks about people's interactions and how they change, specifically focuses on Reading Terminal in Philadelphia. It's a very diverse um, shopping and kind of restaurant area. But basically how in this kind of uh, cosmopolitan canopy, the norms that people bring with them from, ne from their neighborhoods change. They realize that they have to act different because they're in a kind of a different context. So the question then is, do you actually have evidence for this? Right? I've talked about all these ideas. Um, and you can think about this, you know, uh, basic idea, right? This is from Bruce Springsteen. Do you hear the cops finally busting mad and Mary for telling fortunes better than they do? Often, the sci as scientists, we're often expected to give someone, like, a for tell fortunes about things that might, you know, that people are going to think are unexpected, right? So we're supposed to have this element of surprise. But largely what science does is confirm the obvious, right? but gives you a maybe more precise estimate of the obvious. Um, and so what I'm arguing here is this is basically, it's, you know, is not anything that's that new, but arguing that you can marry science, specifically a scientific model, to thinking about how we change places, testing it, and seeing if we have evidence that that works. So the best form of science we have in this kind of context is what's called a randomized controlled trial. So that's our first choice. Um, and then our second choice is what I would call, uh, what people call a quasi-experiment. So that's the idea of you can't do an experiment, but you can kind of emulate it somehow. And I'm going to give you examples of both. So why does changing place matter? One of the reasons, and this is for more of a policy perspective, is you can make the argument that if you structurally change a place, it's sustainable for a long period of time. If the University of South Carolina builds a building, right, that building is going to be there probably after we've all died. Structural changes also impact everyone using the space, not just the most affected. So if you change a place, everyone using that space gets affected. It's also possible that certain kinds of structural changes are scalable to entire populations. It's very difficult, for example, to provide individual treatment to everyone in need. But in some contexts, you could provide structural changes to places that are scaled and address overall kind of population needs. And then the final kind of rationale is that it's a lot easier to change behavior when it becomes part of people's just normally da daily routine. Um, and you know, I, every, anyone knows this if you just look at things just like successes on diets, um, exercise, all the evidence suggests it's it's most successful when it's just part of someone's routine. Take this idea, for example, former director of the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, talks about this idea that there's this pyramid of kind of health impact pyramid. And the idea is at the bottom of the pyramid is that our attributes that have the most effect on community health, like socioeconomic factors, like poverty, uh, concentrated disadvantage. And then as you move up the pyramid, these things be, have less of an overall population effect. Now the challenge is, right, we can develop counseling and education programs that are really effective, but maybe only affect a small segment of the population. Socioeconomic factors are very hard to change from a policy perspective. But I'm making the argument that there are ways to change places that aren't as difficult. And if you think about this idea, it's basically the idea that if you make the healthy choice, the easy choice. So you can think about individual decisions are harder to, harder to make uh, and often then have less of a health impact. A good example is driver, air, driver education. Um, you know, if we educate drivers on being safer, uh, you know, defensive driving school, all the evidence suggests that has a lot, lot smaller effect than something like designing more effective roadways, airbag city living. So 
And I'm going to take this context and apply it to crime. So if you think about the same idea, if you can design environments that aren't just healthier, but they're also safer, it can make kind of a greater overall impact on crime. So what is a randomized trial? I'm not sure who in here has taken research methods. All right, don't worry, I won't quiz you on this. Um, but basically the idea, we take this idea from, and this is the model that's been developed in the field of medicine, because you can't do controlled experiments the same way you can in physics. Um, but the idea is to rely on randomization. So we randomly assign patients, for example, take aspirin or a placebo, and then we test their the effect on headaches. But we can do the same exact model, right? So these two groups are going to be identical on everything but the aspirin or the placebo because of random assignment. We can do the same thing with places, right? We can randomly assign places to AstroTurf or grass and see which reduces their stress. So we're taking these same kind of ideas. But then the question often people have is, does that really work where I live? Or is that just a very specific to where, to where you're studying? And what I'm, what I'm arguing is that even if I give you an example specific, which I'm going to get into some examples, mostly from Philadelphia, it's not that this example will necessarily port to, a play, to Columbia, South Carolina, but you can use the exact same model in a different context. So $100,000 for urban tree planting, for example, uh, in one area uh, that shows it reduces stress, or I'll show you maybe even reduces crime, uh, might not be generalizable to another area, but certainly something you could test. So the built environment matters. I'm trying to make the argument. Um, so here's an example of the built environment, right, in the crime context. Uh, these, this is an abandoned house in, in Detroit, Michigan. So Detroit has a lot of uh, deterioration. This is what's called ruin porn, which is basically just, uh, it's a critique, right? It's kind of an ironic critique, and if you look, if you Google ruined porn, you'll see all kinds of pictures of distressed cities um, like this. Here's an old advert from the New York City Housing Authority. Housing is long considered, right, uh, a method for reducing crime and improving health. So this New York, this ad from, for NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority says, eliminate crime in the slums through housing. See this little drawing with the gun? So these are old ideas. But we probably know without it, we don't even need experimental evidence to point out that public housing, at least on the massive scale, was probably not the best model of urban design. So here's an example of the, uh, of the Pruitt Ego, uh, built in 1959 in St. Louis, abandoned in the 1960s because of, it, because of crime and all kinds of problems, and demolished in the 1970s. Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago, at one point housed over 50,000 people, right? So half the size of probably Columbia um, was torn down, right? So large-scale public housing, probably not the best idea. But then the question often people have is, do we rebuild areas or do we just allow people to escape? I think it's hard to make the argument that you can allow people to move, that you can either allow, not allow, but you can afford uh, to have people move uh, just flee areas, not to mention often people want to stay in the area that they live. Uh, if you look, for example, at the Moving to Opportunities experiment, which was an experiment that allowed people to move out of public housing, basically had a lottery, less than half of the people actually volunteered for the lottery. People decided to choose to live in high-rise public housing in Chicago, Los Angeles, and, um, or there's no high-rise in Los Angeles public housing, but public housing because they didn't want to have to move. So then the question is, what do you do in existing communities? So in Philadelphia, we have the advantage that, uh, or the disadvantage that there's a lot of urban decay, but recognizing this was a problem in this city, the city in uh, 2011 passed a new ordinance, which basically said, it was called the Windows and Doors Ordinance. It basically required that if you're a property owner of abandoned property, you have to install working doors and windows. If you don't, you could face a fine of up to $300 a day. Now, does the city actually collect a fine of $300 a day? I'm being filmed, but um, the answer is no, right? 
Uh, but that, but this is potentially healthy fun. Uh, it has to be on a block that's 80% occupied. So the idea was to try to kind of prevent the spiral of decay. So one of, uh, uh, here's an example um, uh, of a home. So this is the pink notice they put on. So the typical kind of abandoned house in Philadelphia historically would be boarded up. But you can imagine what happens with boarded up homes, right? People break into them. They use them for maybe drug dens. Uh, arson happens. If you put a working window on door on the house, so the argument is the house is, first of all, is less likely to leak. Uh, it's less likely to be broken into. Uh, and then maybe there's some benefits to the surrounding neighborhood. So here's an example of houses that were in compliance with the ordinance. So what we did, is, for example, to look at this is we didn't do a randomized trial, but what we did is we looked at houses before and after the city passed this ordinance. So you can, on, the, on your left, you can look at these as violations. So these are all the houses that are violations in Philadelphia. So you can see that's a lot of houses, right? There's a lot of abandonment in Philadelphia. Then we looked after the law was passed, uh, those who became in compliance, as well as those who actually filed for a renovation permit. So one way to uh, show your compliance is to actually file for a construction permit to have worked on the house to bring it up, uh, up to code. So you can think of this in some way as the treatment is becoming compliant and the control condition is not becoming compliant. Now you may ask your, yourself or you may think to yourself, well maybe those aren't the same kinds of homes. Uh, and that's true. This is a quasi-experiment. So the best we can do is basically compare homes in the same kind of sections of the city that had similar, <coughs> similar age, uh, similar basic housing stock, uh, but some chose, some property owners chose to make this modest investment. And what we found is that there was about a 20% reduction in assaults, a 39% reduction in gun assaults, uh, and a 16% reduction in nuisance crimes after houses became compliant. So just by simply putting a working window and door. And there was no evidence that crime simply moved uh, to near, nearby areas. If we take these estimates from this study, we scale them up to the city, it would suggest you could prevent is, uh, more than 300 uh, gun assaults in a year uh, simply by making all houses compliant. Now that's a back of the envelope calculation, so I would, you know, I don't know if that's actually what would happen, uh, but it suggests you can get a substantial effect. Um, and I can talk about some qualitative evidence we have that seems to suggest why abandoned houses are problematic. Um, we actually right now they'll have a randomized trial in in the field where we're going to actually do this as an experiment and see if we get kind of similar results. So now I'm just talking a little bit about housing. And now the question is, what about all that stuff I talked about, green space, right? The nature cure. So there's this idea now that's coming, it's being kicked around in medicine, literally about, it's called the nature cure. So it's this idea that you might go visit your doctor, uh, and he or she will say, well, in addition to rehabbing your knee, it suggests you go for lots of walks around the horseshoe here, right? And take in that green space. That there's something psychologic that happens to people it also affects our physiology of spending time in nature. Now, uh, and there's some evidence now uh, growing that, that nature, there are nature effects on crime. Now, most of the evidence today suggests, for example, that trees are good for our cardiovascular, psychological, respiratory health. Most of this research, though, uh, there's some research that suggests, for example, vegetation trees around housing reduces crime. But most of this research uh, is descriptive. In other words, what I mean by that, there's clear selection problems. So if you think about it, if I told you somebody is healthier because they live near a running trail, you may say, well, the healthier people want to live near running trails. Or if I told you that people are less stressed that have houses that have nicely manicured lawns, you'd say, well, yeah, well, that's because they're different. It's different in the first place. You know, those are different people. They have different life circumstances. They can invest in their housing. But we do have some, we do have some lab tape based studies that show when you show people different pictures, 
of nature, their heart rates go down. So those are labs, those are you know, studies done with like undergrads at places like the University of South Carolina. That doesn't necessarily tell you about the real world. There is though a pretty compelling study that I'll give you an example of that I'll talk about my own uh, by, uh, by a geographer named Ehrlich that appeared in Science Magazine, which is, um, you know, for, for academics, that's, you know, the top, what, what, what's the word, Bobby, high cotton? Venue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> top venue, high cotton, right? <laughs> the idea is that, you know, if you can publish in Science Magazine, you know, that's, that's the top venue. So Ehrlich, what he did is he, he, his study examined the records of patients on the third, second and third floor of a hospital over a 10-year period, hospital in Delaware County, uh, Pennsylvania. So what he looked at was in this hospital, he noticed there certain rooms had a view of a garden and other rooms had views of a brick wall. So, right, hospital rooms, you don't, and there isn't like first class room, second class, you know, there isn't the penthouse, right? Basic rooms get people get randomly assigned to. So what he decided to do is he collected data on those who had undergone uh, gallbladder surgery uh, where they didn't have any post-surgical complications. So gallbladders get taken out often, especially when you're like my age. Um, hopefully it won't happen. Not going wood. Uh, but it's not life-ending if it's taken out. Fairly routine surgery. Uh, and he looked at surgery, so people who got the gallbladder surgery, no post-surgical complications during the spring through fall months. So the idea is they're, you know, you're not staring out at a garden with like an empty tree, right? There's actual something there to look at. And he looked at this, uh, he matched people based on sex, their age, uh, if they were a smoker, if they were obese or not, the year of the surgery, uh, their past hospital history. And he compared 46 patients, so these are matched pairs, those assigned to a room with the garden view and those assigned to a room with the, with the view of a brick wall. He found that the patients with the, the garden view room were uh, recovered from the hospital, uh, were discharged quicker, um, they reported uh, uh, that there were less instances of reports to pain to the nurse, and on average, uh, they were uh, they're basically likely to be discharged one day earlier. So some evidence that just being able to look at something nice helps your recovery. But you know that's just health. Well, what about crime? One of the challenges often is studies, when we do experiments, we often do them in situations that maybe aren't reflective of what we're really interested in. The good thing about place-based experiments is that you can actually do them in the places that are being affected by things like crime and poor health. So this is an example I'm going to walk you through of our experiment. Actually started not off, we originally did a quasi-experimental study of this, and then we decided to do an experiment. So this is the Lucky Seven Tavern. I'm dating myself. This is from the original Rocky movie, Sylvester Stallone. Uh, well, the Lucky Seven was an actual tavern in South Philadelphia. Um, and then it was torn down, and it had seen better days. And then eventually, uh, the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, as part of its program, which I'm going to talk about, came and rehabbed this blighted, vacant piece of land and made this kind of picket fence park-like setting. This is from uh, well, this is from the Rocky movie, and this is from Google Street View. So you can go back and, so I have no idea who this guy is right here, just walking the street. But, so the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society has this program where they go around the city of Philadelphia and they green vacant lots. Uh, we did an earlier study where we looked at what happened to lots before and after they are green, and we found some evidence that both crime went down and there were some, uh, we had residents uh, report, the people who report about their health in the community, some evidence that people were more likely to walk and, re and reported less stress. So we decided to actually put this to a real experiment. So what they do is they basically remove the trash and debris, they grade the land, they'll plant grass and maybe a small tree, and they s install this park-like kind of low picket fence. It's about $5 per square meter, 
Uh, so you can think about this, about $1,500 to do a small lot. Um, and it costs about 50 cents per square meter to maintain. So you know, 150 bucks or so a year uh, to maintain. It's basically the cost of paying somebody to mow your uh, small yard, pick up the trash. So we uh, actually did a citywide clustered randomized trial. This appears in the uh, Proceedings National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so we decided to take this idea and test it on scale. We have both the quantitative and qualitative um, uh, uh, evidence. So what we did is we looked at, um, you know, you can think of this as kind of before, this is an overgrown area, it gets, uh, uh, de you know, it gets uh, scraped up, and then this grass is painted. Here's another example of a setting. Uh, corner lot, abandoned, overgrown with weeds and trash. This is what it looks like after the intervention. So basic setup, right? You, is you take a place that's blighted, overgrown with weeds, filling up with trash, and you convert it to, you know, not really a park, but kind of a pocket park, if you will. And so we actually did this through a randomized trial. We took uh, 541 randomly selected lots vacant lots in Philadelphia, and we uh, randomized them to receive the full green, green, cleaning, greening, and maintenance, uh, a partial cleaning and maintenance, so this is basically just picking up the trash, or nothing. You should see all these lots, but in the city of Philadelphia we have still, I think, about a little over 30,000 vacant lots, so this was like a very, this was a random sample representing the city, but still a, a drop in the bucket. I'm not really doing a good job of selling Philadelphia as a place to come and visit, but uh, so what happens in former industrial cities, right? Um, this is just a balance table just to show you, and the only thing I'll mention is this, the whole point of this table is just to say that the groups look similar. So we surveyed, um, uh, we surveyed uh, 445 residents that lived around these lots, and we also collected crime data. And, um, the residents look similar in terms of age, how long they've lived in the neighborhood, basic demographics. Um, the areas are about the same residential population, had about the serious same amount of crime before the intervention. So as far as we can tell, the areas look identical, but we randomly assigned some to receive uh, the treatment and some to receive control. So what I want to do now is just kind of walk you through some of the findings. So these are residents' perceptions of crime. So this first estimate just shows what happens to residents in these areas before and after the intervention. And we can see these are percentage reductions. So this suggests that residents' relative perception of crime, so this question is there's a lot of crime in our neighborhood, drops by 37% after the intervention. Uh, vandalism, uh, the perception of vandalism, 39%. Uh, not going out because of safety concerns, 57%. Now there's a big confidence interval on this, so uh, it could be as low as 3% or as high as 82%, but still substantial reduction. Hanging out, relaxing, socializing goes up substantially. Now one of the things that's worth pointing out is we did not tell the residents that their area was part of a treatment study. The residents and the survey collection team were blinded to the experiment. They, did, they knew that they were helping collect data, but we didn't tell them if a lot near them was being green. If we look at the kind of any intervention, so this is kind of the main intervention, so just any intervention means the full cleaning, greening, or just the trash remediation pickup. We still see some reductions in terms of perceptions of crime, uh, but nothing else that's consistent. So suggesting it's not just picking up trash and sending people there, but it's really that full kind of uh, greening remediation that seems to map. Uh, we also looked at crime, right? Uh, actual reports of crime to the police, and we see similar kinds of uh, benefits. Uh, all crimes go down by about 4.2% relative to control lots. Um, you may ask, want to know how many crimes that is. Basically what we did is around each area we kind of drew buffers about a thousand feet and we kind of uh, scaled crime up to where that lot was. So this is going to be something on the order of about 10 crimes. So you get about four fewer crimes uh, in a month 
by remediating vacant lots. And these are all done kind of in clustered areas. Um, you see gun assaults go down by about 3% um, and kind of across the board. Uh, you see some larger reductions in neighborhoods that are below the poverty line. And those are neighborhoods in general that just have higher rates of crime in the first place, especially gun assaults. Now, often the question is, this analysis doesn't tell you anything about like what the treat, it just says treatment, not treatment. So what we did is we also looked at, well, let, what actually happened to these lots? And we had uh, graduate students basically go and code pictures that we took of the lots about the relative improvement. And so what you can see here is, this is a full intervention, and we have basically uh, deteriorated, minor improvement, major improvement. So based on ratings over time, you, know, you can see on average, full intervention improved, <coughs> partial intervention kind of minor improvement, and then no intervention, what you see is deterioration. Like these areas tend to get, continues to get worse, more trash gets dumped on them, the weeds get higher, uh, you know, they're starting to look worse. So what we did without getting any technical details is we said, well, let's predict the improvement of the lot based on being assigned to a treatment group. And then let's use that prediction of improvement and let's see how well it tells us what it tells us about crime. And see here you see bigger effects. When you actually look at the, those who received the treatment, you see a 9% reduction in crime uh, and uh, what the press really picked up on was this 29, the 17% and 29% reduction in gun assaults. So when the area really improves, it seems like gun assaults uh, drop substantially as well as all crime. This, this would uh, equate to about one fewer gun assault per month uh, in these clusters of vacant lots. So that one doesn't sound like a lot, but again, this is a, you know, a, as an experiment. It does suggest a fairly sizable effect, uh, and it's a citywide intervention that could be scaled. You have to hire a lot more contractors, but it's possible. My back of the envelope calculations suggest that you could probably scale to the entire city for about 34 to 45 million dollars, which once upon a time seemed like a ton of money, but you know, compared to uh, other public, uh, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure investments, it's fairly small, a lot cheaper than building a rail line. Um, it's a one-time money, and it would probably cost you about five, cost the city about five million dollars a year to maintain. Um, that intervention, based on our analysis, could reduce shootings by as much as 350 a year. In the city of Philadelphia, we average something around 1,300 shootings a year. So, um, suggesting you could get a sizable reduction. Now, if we put that in economic costs, that would suggest you get it's about $14,570 uh, for one averted shooting. But the average shooting cost, just in direct medical costs, is like $25,000 and far more expensive than that in terms of the total social costs. So this is a pretty cheap return on your investment from a policy perspective. Now clearly it's not just the lots, it's all the things that go into it, right? It's not just the treatment of them, it's probably the police, it's the communities that get involved. So what about trees? I've talked about grass and, and, and vacant lots. So there is some evidence out there that trees <laughs> um, So there's some evidence out there that maybe houses with nicer trees have less crime around them. But you could say again, eh, those are wealthier communities. Well, there's an effort to try to control for those differences, but still, you know, ideally you'd want some kind of randomized trial where trees were essentially randomly improved or destroyed around homes, and then you could look at crime. So a few years back, I was reading a paper in American uh, Preventive Medicine that found that you could correlate uh, mortality rates in the United States with the investation of the emerald ash borer, which um, I don't know if it's made it down to South Carolina yet, but if it isn't, it's coming. Um, so the emerald ash borer is an invasive pest. 
It's a beetle, a green beetle that came over from, from China on, um, as far as we can tell, probably on, on lumber. Um, and it kills ash trees. It basically sucks the water out of the ash trees and then they die. Um, but it's very hard to detect until it's done its nasty work. So here's a picture from Toledo, Ohio, before and after this neighborhood was devastated by the, act, by the emerald ash borer. So the emerald ash borer, obviously, uh, it started, it was first, first detected in Michigan, and then it spread east, uh, and a little bit of pocket here in, in, in Colorado. It's, and it spread bigger sets then. It took, killed over uh, a million ash trees. Um, ash trees were a popular tree to be planted, in, in, uh, especially in the 1950s. Uh, dur during suburban development, developers want to save money, so what they usually do is plant like all the same kind of trees, right? Which is cheap, it's efficient, but when those trees get hit by invasive pests, all the tree stock gets wiped out. So this is a big problem. Now that clearly the Emerald Ash Board does not pick neighborhoods based on socioeconomic status, right? It doesn't say, oh, these, these ash trees are tastier in this neighborhood, right? Um, it just kind of hops from tree to tree. Uh, so, um, so Jeff Donovan, who was an economist at the U.S. Forest Service, had done this study, and he had found uh, that this, be this beetle, this invasive pest, was correlated with mortality rates. He showed, for example, that there were roughly 1,300, uh, it basically looked at mortality rates across 1,300 counties as the ash borer spread. And he suggests that you get about an additional 6.8 respiratory and 6.7 cardiovascular deaths per year uh, per, for 100,000 adults based on the spread of this tree. Largest effect seen in counties that have had ash borer for four years. And it's kind of a test that this is, there's got to be something about health. He found that there's no effect on accident caused deaths. So almost all the death effect he could see in mortality was based on people that were dying from a respiratory uh, or cardiovascular uh, based disease. So why am I talking about this is I read this study and I thought, oh, hey, you could do something like this with crime. And so I called Jeff and asked him uh, if he could help me find a city. Uh, if we could do this idea of crime, he immediately picked up on it, said, oh yeah, I've actually done some studies on crime um, and uh, trees, but yeah, not, never thought about this. And so he found that, he said, oh, Ohio's been hit really hard. And he called the Forest Service in Cincinnati, Ohio, and found that they actually, the location of all the ash trees that they that had been destroyed. And so what he did is we got data uh, from uh, the police department, from the U.S. Forest Service on where ash tree deaths, uh, ash tree destructions were occurring. And then I got the crime data from the Cincinnati Police Department, sending them this memo, uh, basically saying that I wanted to study trees and crime. And no, I'm not crazy, right? Um, and fortunately, somebody at the University of Cincinnati vouched for me and said, yeah, he, this isn't uh, a cr as crazy a study as it seems. All right, what we found though is that there was a significant increase in crime associated with losing trees. So for every, uh, you get about a one to two percent uh, uh, increase in crime per lost tree. So, uh, and obviously in the scale here, this is just an estimate to kind of show that the effect gets much bigger, right, as you get into areas with more tree loss. As far as we can tell, we control for demographics. There's nothing socioeconomic about this. It just really has to do kind of where the tree locations are. So I think what I've tried to argue here is that place-based interventions that make environment safer can complement kind of these demand side interventions, these ideas about trying to change individual behavior. But we can do this more of this work through experiments where we bed them into planning designs try to figure out what works, and we can tell that to city planners, policy makers, before they adopt wholesale changes to things. That structural changes to places will make lasting and long-term effects that are scalable and reproducible. It's easy to reproduce remediating vacant lot. It's harder to reproduce the charisma of an individual teacher or counselor. So look, we've done a series of poorly planned community designs around this country for hundreds of years. 
So why not actually try to use science to figure out what works in what context? So maybe the health benefits of places and the plant examples that I showcased uh, that are being connected to medical treatment ideas, part of what I talked about in terms of nature cure. But perhaps some of the, our desires for green pace, space, connected sidewalks, and social interaction is actually just rooted in our basic DNA or our hereditary selection of habitat. Pulitzer Prize winning biologist Wilson notes that children from around the world, not yet acculturated in their living environment, when shown pictures in laboratory experiments, tend to choose ecosystems that have three common features. A vantage point looking down, a vista with a view of a park and grass with scattered trees, and proximity to a bottle of water, whether stream, pond, lake, or ocean. So the choices that these children make, Wilson hypothesized, are rooted in our human, in the human ancestral heritage of the savannas of Africa. Is it any wonder why people pay more to live in properties with a view looking over a beach, a lake, rivers, parklands? This has been one of the defining problems of mankind and her environment. The conflict between environmental and economic efficiency of compact, dense urban environments and our natural human inclination to want to live in healthier and happier natural landscapes. So thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions people have. studies is um, is to uh, do what's called a kernel density so you basically take the midpoint and then you weight crime at a distance so like a thousand feet and so that crimes that are closer to that location get counted more is there any conflict in like I would imagine that there might be multiple abandoned houses next to each other and yeah. some would be compliant and some would not be happy. yeah so what we try to do uh, in that that's a good point we're actually doing this in the trial uh, is we even with this analysis, we try to do is pick kind of controls that are fur, fur, further enough a point so that there might be some slight overlap in crime, but just a little bit. And then in that study, we actually drew boundaries around, so we look for displacement. So if crime goes down around these homes, does it pop up nearby? And we didn't see that evidence of kind of like that spatial kind of displacement. It doesn't mean that crime like goes down citywide, but it, probably moves some places, but maybe not as mechanically as strong. What we're doing right now in the randomized trials, we're, we're basically building clusters of homes, and then we're randomizing some clusters to receive the treatment, others not. Um, fingers crossed I can get those contracts signed off and we can get the work started soon. Um, and that's this approach we also use with vacant lots, because we don't want to compare one lot to kind of sets of clusters. Um, and that's probably about the best you can do. Questions. Um, warm. Yeah, so um, when you guys did the um, the, the the different levels of uh, restoration of lots, did you actually talk to some of the residents who live around there to yes. sort of see if they noticed it? Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So Philippe, who was the author of, uh, we talked. We had community members involved, kind of in the planning of that study, and. Um, and we'd heard lots of stories uh, from community members about how much they appreciated those lots in the first place. But in this experiment, we actually had two anthropologists, well, a professor in anthropology, Philippe, and his graduate student, uh, basically do an ethnographic study in, in two sections of the city that were part of the experiment. Um, and, uh, and got to observe things like changes in the drug market after a lot was, was uh, remediated. Mm -hmm. So that drug dealers would move to, from the vacant lot to abandoned house. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also I heard a lot that from the people doing the work in the community, uh, just picking up the trash, uh, for example, that uh, community members would come out and say, when are you come back to green a lot? You know, that there's this recognition, like there's this program, they want it. Um, they saw something going on. They saw something going on, they want more of that investment. 
Um, I will say that one of the neighborhoods, though, there was tension going on because, not necessarily because of these lots, but these lots in, in one section of South Philadelphia are quickly getting converted to uh, new home construction, mm. which is bringing in gentrification, which then uh, changes people's property values, right? So then there's this tension between neighbors that have been there, want the neighborhood improving, but don't want to get priced out because of, so now the city has allowed people to file for kind of like a home exemption if you've been there for a period of time. But that's still a tension in certain neighborhoods. But most of the neighborhoods in Philadelphia, like there's, there, that kind of tension doesn't exist because the biggest problem is people are leaving, not that they're coming. Did y'all also do anything to look at sort of the routine activities around the different uh, things? Like, is there any video surveillance? No, so that, you know, we might be able to get it now, but we actually had a, a plan to uh, post kind of like time-lapse videos up, mm -hmm. but uh, Penn's IRB wouldn't allow us to do it. They said mm -hmm. it was too invasive, which um, it's public space. Uh, I didn't really quite understand the rationale. So the only thing you could do really is just go send somebody to sit there and watch. Yeah, so we did have, uh, we did have these kind of deteriorate, we had pictures, uh, kind of we did these pictures of different intervals and tried to have people count stuff up, but it turned out to be very difficult. Much mm -hmm. better approach would be able to get everyone's, uh, you know, cell phone data and see how much activity was happening mm -hmm. around lots. And then importantly, if the activity changes. So I think that's an area where there could be a lot more uh, future work. One of, our uh, one of our collaborators um, did do a study though where she um, randomly assigned, she's a, a physician, she randomly assigned people to walk by uh, the abandoned lots, either the treated ones or the control ones, um, and then measured their stress. Um, she didn't tell them, she just gave them walking paths, and she found that stress levels go up substantially when you're walking, which kind of makes sense. If, for those of us who have kids, you know, like when they're really young, they want you to like, you know, uh, keep the closet door open in case there's monsters hiding in there. You know, I mean, think about it. Just your stress level goes up if you're walking around a place that really looks like, uh, you know, it, it's unkept. Yeah. Um, so there's there's more, and we're actually she's actually partnering with us now, or piggybacking our, on our, our randomized trial of abandoned houses to actually do a more comprehensive analysis of stress because you can do this through saliva, you can swab people, mm -hmm. or have them spit into something for a couple of days. And you can te test our cortisol and see if they're basically what's called a kind of acute. So it's like short-term stress versus long-term stress markers to see if that goes down. Then you go over and have a bad roommate in college, right? Your stress level goes up, you know, so or bad neighbor, right? So you imagine just like having a bad property next door probably, you know, that's just my kind of prior on it. Yeah. Kind of the heart of that idea about you know a place 
being well kept for, kept up. Um, but the part of it is you have to maintain it, right? I, these lots, uh, if you go by them in Philadelphia, when they're not being maintained in the winter, there'll be, they'll be trash all over them, right? It's the idea, though, is you have to have somebody come and pick it up, right? So, yeah. So, yes, I guess. And, and the green criminology question. So, yeah, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm part way there. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we should start a field of green. Uh, is there a field of green criminology? I mean, yeah. Oh, okay, well, there you go. I guess, I'm, I, guess I am. <laughs> I, too, am a green criminologist. Okay. So, you ASC section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another division of AS, the American Association of Criminology, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think this is one area that we, where you can intersect a lot with epidemiology and other fields, and, and and we have theories that make sense, and there's a lot of good work we can do. And ultimately, what's interesting is these studies all started off as health studies, but then you find these crime effects, and people are far more interested in the crime effects than they are, you know, people's feelings of depression or stress. Because I think everyone has this visceral connection to crime, right? Through the personal experience, vicarious experience. If you can tell, if you Give them evidence of something that actually reduces that. It's something that people in general like. I mean, who doesn't like grass in the neighborhood, right? Uh, maybe if you're an astroturf company, you don't. But I mean, in general, right? So, so yeah. Um, anyway, long-winded answer. Thanks. You know what we were all just thinking when you said, "Who doesn't like grass?" <laughs> 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 Doug at the University of California, Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all.